So uh, you, uh, you, you got through college, and college is hard, harder when you're working weekends, selling funnel cakes in order to just be able to survive. But getting by is not enough. You have to succeed. You have to thrive. You have to, you have to you know, chase that dream. And at some point, you realize that there was more opportunity. Uh, so how did you actually end up working for Goldman Sachs? I mean, out of, out of all the different tropes in this election season, uh, to have you know, DACA and working at Goldman Sachs kind of connected in this narrative is pretty <laughs> amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I was walking around on campus my sophomore year in college, and I started to develop this idea that uh, maybe if I could become financially and professionally successful, that I could earn my way into America. Mm. Because one of the biggest things I heard growing up, and we still hear it now, is that immigrants, and especially undocumented immigrants, that we come to take, that we come to somehow drain the system, and that we come to just get on welfare and get all of these government services. So I wanted to prove to this country that that's not why we come here. And that in fact, I wasn't just going to just get by. Like I was going to reach for the stars, and I was going to make it as high as I possibly could. And then I saw this poster on campus that said I could make $10,000 working on Wall Street for the summer. And for a young woman who had $5 in her bank account, then $10,000 seemed like the answer to all of her problems. And I thought, that's, like, that's where I need to go. I need to go work on Wall Street. And then I became a finance major, and I got a bunch of other internships so that I could be qualified to apply for an internship at Goldman. I applied to the internship at Goldman. I got the internship. I went to New York for the summer, and I, my one goal for the summer was to get an offer. Like Even if I didn't like the job where I was working or the team that I was working for, I wanted to get an offer so then I could use that offer to go work at wherever other firm I wanted to go work or other groups within Goldman. And by the end of the summer, um, I remember like very distinctly going to go say bye to everyone and taking little handwritten thank you notes to all the people that I worked with. And one of the managing directors um, walked me to the elevator and he said, um, come September, you should expect some good news. So that could only mean I'm getting an offer. And I remember getting the elevator and I wanted to jump like up and down of like happiness and joy that I hadn't even graduated college and I already had an offer from the most prestigious investment bank in the world. And I was happy for like five minutes, and I called my mom, and then it and then it hit me like, how am I actually going to take this job because I still don't have papers, and I'm gonna have to go through background checks, and not just from Goldman, but from the SEC and from Finra to get all my trading licenses. So how am I actually going to to do this? Um, but but I knew that I didn't have any other choice but to take that job offer. Because if I didn't take it, then I was going to regret it the rest of my life. And if somehow I got caught, then, then I got caught. But if I wasn't going to succeed, it wasn't going to be because I didn't try. I mean, immigrants would get the job done. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's, a, there's an amazing uh, pivot there, right, just in the elevator of, of you know, ecstasy to almost despair. And uh, in calling your parents, what was their reaction? Because they obviously, if anybody knew the circumstances you were facing, it was them. D did they say, we have a plan? Did they say, you're going to have to not do that? Did they have any comfort whatsoever for you? And, and how did you actually then proceed to navigating that? Um, I mean, my mom, anytime I call her with, uh, with any problem, um, she always tells me to pray. <laughs> She's like, just pray on it. Um, and I was like, okay, but uh, I need like an answer like now. <laughs> so like, you know, where's my answer? Um, and I talked to I talked to lawyers, and I, I every year I would I would go I would go like see a lawyer and, and try to figure out if there was a way for me to fix my immigration status. Like, was there any new law that that would that would that I would qualify for? And the answer was always no. Like, you don't qualify for any kind of relief. You don't. There's no way for us to fix your to fix your immigration status. Um, and at some point before I got this offer. I had to shut down my funnel cake stand because a museum was built. 
where I had my funnel kick stand, and so I had to um, get a job. And the only way to get a job was to have a social security number and a green card. And so I um, bought fake papers. And I never thought or imagined that I would use those papers to work outside of like the mall that I was working <laughs> at. Okay, um, I could, I would never have imagined. And 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 also, I, I was really hopeful because the Dream Act was introduced in 2001, and the Dream Act is a piece of legislature that would um, have given a path to citizenship to young undocumented people who came here when they were children, who were in school or who had served in the military, um, who were upstanding upstanding citizens, quote unquote. Um, and that was introduced in 2001. And so I, I thought, like, this makes so much sense that there should be a path for people like myself who are in college, who are doing good things for America to become citizens. And every year I saw it fail. And, 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 and it's 2016 and the DREAM Act still has never passed. Um, but so I had these papers and I thought, I'm going to use them. And if I get caught and I get deported, to me that was no worse than not being able to pursue my ambitions mm. and, and what I had so work, worked so hard to, to, to earn. Um, so I, I filled out the papers. I showed up to Goldman. Um, and I was, ter I was terrified. You know, I, I, that, it, it wasn't, now I can, I talk about it um, casually in some ways, but, but making that decision as a 19 year old, as a 20 year old, uh, making the decision that I'm going to break the law. You know, I, I can't even, I can't even really express fully what it felt like to make that decision mm -hmm. and to feel like that's the only choice I had. Um, and somehow these papers worked. Um, and then I was sitting at my desk um, as a first year analyst working for Goldman Sachs. So your mom was like, so God was right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good praying there. Um, but the fact is you, you, you were then employed by what was clearly the most prestigious uh, investment bank in the world. And you weren't just working you know, in uh, some sort of corner of the company, right? You were dealing at the very highest level with, you know, in wealth management with uh, high profile individuals, uh, people who are bringing in huge sums of money uh, and trusting, you know, kind of the, the gears of, of our capitalist economy <laughs> in your hands. And you were doing something specific. You were creating derivatives, uh, which, you know, obviously a there's been a, a lot of conversation around those now. But uh, you were, and you were excelling, right? So. How long did you spend there, and then at what point did you finally feel like something was missing? Um, so yeah, I, 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 it's so funny to me because um, somebody said recently to me, like, you just want like nobody to like you because on one side you have people who are like, you illegal, get out of our country. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many people want me deported, but I'm like, I'm an American citizen. I can't get deported. Um, but they're like, you know, those people don't like you. And then the people who maybe are empathetic to you because you're an immigrant, but then you worked on Wall Street, like they don't like you. So like, nobody <laughs> likes you. Um, and I'm like, yeah, I know it's tough. It's a tough life I live. Um, but I, I, I was, I was uh, structuring derivatives, uh, not like mortgage backed right. derivatives, but, um, and I like, I was doing really well. And um, I really, even though there were, there were definitely moments throughout that journey where um, you know, I was asked to go to London, for example. Well, I can't go to London because I can't leave the country. Right? There, were, there were opportunities um, for uh, upward mobility that I had to um, pass on because I knew that it would require international travel. And that was really frustrating for me to not be able to take advantage of every opportunity was beyond frustrating. Um, and, and really the moment that put everything into question was in 2007 when I was drinking my coffee, eating my piece of toast with peanut butter, no jelly. Um, <laughs> and I got this phone call from my sister in Mexico that our dad was really sick. And at that point, I had to decide if I was going to go to Mexico. And if I did that, how was I going to come back? 
And if I did come back this time, I would be crossing the border, which would make me ineligible for any kind of relief ever under the current system. Um, and then it's also dangerous, right? Like I, I, I always think of the people who have risked their lives to come here. Um, like I didn't have to do that. I, I came here on a plane, right? But this time I would have to come in illegally. But if I didn't go and then something happened, how was I going to live with myself the rest of my life knowing that, that I chose this versus being with my father? Um, and in the, in the hours of sort of agonizing over what to do, uh, my dad passed away. And I never got to see him alive again. I never, and, and it's been nine, nine years now, and I mean, every time I talk about it, I get choked up a little bit because like that, that was, you know, in, in my book, what is the cost of the American dream? To me, that was the cost I had to pay, was never seeing my dad alive again. And it was a really high, high price. And, and at that point, I thought it's too high of a price to pay, and I can't be here anymore, and I can't do this anymore. Um, and I thought, you know, as the song goes, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. And I thought I made it in New York. I'm going to, not to get all LeBron, but I was like, I'm going to take my talent somewhere else. Um, Cleveland? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, um, no comment. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but it was at that point that I really started questioning everything. And I thought, you know, what's, what's the point of, like, having all this wealth and this status and, and, and this professional achievements if I can't even use them for the right moments? Right? Like, buying a plane ticket the day of wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. Like, from a financial standpoint, that was not a problem, right? Um, but what's the point if, like, I can't even be with my family? Mm -hmm. So that's really when I started, when everything sort of shifted, and then I knew that um, that 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 it had to change, that I had to change, that that I had to be doing something different, and I I started making all sorts of plans to um, to go back to to Mexico and um, and to try to make a life there. <laughs> 